Imagine a town where there are no small joints, just small stoners, where Kush is a girl's best friend, and law-breaking is the new liberty. It's the Hollywood Hemptress Hour, hosted by your honey blunt Hemptress, Terry Joyce. Yeah! Thanks for staying tuned. Today our guest is Kevin Patton. Uh, he is uh, a revolutionary uh, young journalist uh, who worked for Cannabis Times Magazine. Most notably, he did an article on Jesse Ventura uh, for his book, Conspiracy Theory. Uh, he, I met him uh, doing Occupy. We knew each other before that. Uh, and we were in Occupy Los Angeles together. And here's my thought about Occupy. I think it's one of the greatest movements to come across this world that's been uh, to date. We need it. We need people to stay. We need young people. We need old people. We need everybody to stand up for the injustices that are happening globally uh, in terms of our financial tyranny that's going on. Now, some people say, you know what, what, what were those people? Were they homeless people? You know, are, are they communists? Are they hippies? You know, people that don't want to, like, fit into the system. Well, you know what? We are in a system. There is a lie, and one of the liars is television. I mean, think about it. I mean, how much are we getting brain-fucked? Okay, I'm just going to say we're getting brain-fucked by watching sitcoms like M.A.S.H., and I'm not saying it's not a good show, but, you know, basically, you're seeing a couple, like, really witty dudes drinking martinis in a tent. And that is our version of, like, look how fun the war is and, look what great heroes we are. And speaking of heroes, what about Hogan's Heroes? You know, a sitcom about concentration camps. What the hell's wrong with us? That's like doing a sitcom on the crucifixion of Christ. Come on, people. We need to do better than this. And so you ask... When it all comes down to the day, people go, we don't get what this Occupy thing is, and what their message is. It's because the people that have paid for your television time don't want you to find out. So stay tuned and find out. Next we have Ken Patton. We will be right back. I don't know anything about government. Luckily, Terry Joyce does, and she tells me what to think, say, and do. Terry Joyce was a carnival freak for years. I'm not wearing any pants, and Terry Joyce is going to fight for my right to get them back. That's why I'm asking you to watch the Hollywood Hemptress Hour with Terry Joyce. Trust me, I'm medicated. in Los Angeles. Hello, DJ. Hey, Carrie. How are you? I'm doing well. Uh, Good. I, under <laughs> I understand that you've been doing some, uh, it's been an interesting day for you, you've been doing some court support uh, for marijuana down in Devonshire. What's, what's going on with that? Well, you know, kind of to maybe refresh some of our, our listeners, um, we had kind of a battle here in Los Angeles in the San Fernando Valley that took place about two to three years ago where the Devonshire Division of the Los Angeles Police Department decided to shut down all of the dispensaries in their policing division 
and it included uh, specific neighborhoods in the San Fernando Valley, um, Mission Hills, um, uh, I guess like North Mission Hills, uh, Northridge, Granada Hills, Devonshire, uh, Chatsworth, that area of the city, the LAPD was effective in um, aggressively raiding and shutting down all of the dispensaries and um, having state charges pressed against them, um, trying to accuse them of all kinds of different things. It wasn't a, a blanket situation with what they charged everyone with, but they were, they were able to scare people enough um, with taking their property, taking their children, um, just all kinds of different things that they got most of the people there to plead out. I've been doing court support uh, for one of the operators out there who refuses to take a plea agreement. And um, as a result, the LA County Prosecutor's Office has dragged this out for three years. And, and um, you know, I, I did. I went to court with her today, and her attorney was, uh, had filed a motion to be heard to bring um, the testimony of the confidential informant into question and therefore bringing evidence on the search warrant to question because it's that confidential informant's testimony that allegedly triggered the search warrant. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the judge refuses, you know, first the, the people, you know, the prosecutor for the people, um, they, they want, you know, they, they refuse to give up the confidential informant um, or, or even, you know, um, uh, you know, they even were talking about getting uh, an affidavit and things signed by this person if they didn't want to reveal who it was just to be able to get the testimony from the person and not necessarily put them on the stand on the public. And they, they wouldn't do it. And today he tried to get the judge to see why legally that should happen and, and brought forth different uh, cases that talk about this, and the judge refused to let it happen. Um, and so it just it, it plods along. Her attorney is doing everything he can to just get them to drop the case. Um, and if they won't, she's already said she's not going to take a plea, um, and it will be going before a jury. So, I mean, if she doesn't take a plea, I mean, what is the final result? Like, let's say she lost the case. What, what is her ultimate sentence if that, if that happens? Well, if, um, that's a good question. I believe that the ju if, if she is found guilty by a jury, mm -hmm. um, she, she will not be able to, uh, I don't, she, well, she may be able to appeal. Uh, probably the next thing that would happen would appeal. But even if she lost on appeal, I think the, she would be looking at three years. And that would be in prison? Still, uh, that, would be, that would be in a uh, state prison. Wow. So, yeah, it's interesting. It's a state case. And I, I'm, you know, I, I prompted her uh, criminal defense attorney to ask you know, what's going on here because there have been other cases where eventually prosecutors here in L.A. drop them. Uh, when they're trying to come after a dispensary locally. And for whatever reason, they just won't with her. And there's a couple factors here. One, um, the, the judge in, in this case just seems absolutely spineless, and he's willing to let the prosecutors run his courtroom. Um, the second thing is uh, Rihanna Haju had a stroke while she was in custody with the LAPD because they refused to let her have her blood pressure medication. Oh, my God. And um, she has not been um, shy about letting it be known that when this criminal case is done, she's going after them in a civil suit. Okay. All right. So there we have the big culprits. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow, thank you uh, so much for uh, sharing that with us. Uh, what can our viewers do to possibly, I mean, is there is, is there a way that we can add support to this? Um, well, absolutely. I mean, she is, she is behind in um, paying her attorney right now. She still owes him a couple grand. And as you can see, they keep dragging this out. So she's got to pay for his time to go down there yet again. So certainly people... Uh, can make a donation at our website at cannabissaveslimes.org. 
Uh, everyone's donation is 100% tax deductible, and we can use it for legal defense as, as, as well as everything else we're doing in Washington and here in Los Angeles and, and, and so forth. And people can sign up for email updates on our website and get involved and learn more. Great. So if they wanted to do a donation specifically for this particular reason, um, would, should they just let you know? Like, is there is there a code that they said this this is going towards her legal defense? Um, you know, what they can do is certainly, um, uh, I don't think the PayPal is going to let them, like, you know, there, there's not a way to earmark a donation. Yes. But if people, if people want to do that, they certainly uh, can, can send an email to me personally. Mm -hmm. And let me know that you know they either made a donation or they'd like to make a donation specifically to that, and and we will use it specifically for that. Great, and uh, so thank you so much for uh, calling in. You're giving us all the scoop that's going down in Los Angeles and and what's going on with marijuana news uh, around the country. Uh, thank and, you. Thanks uh, for taking my report. Thank you. And make sure that you give, uh, you know, again, CannabisSavesLives.org. Uh, join them. Make a donation. Uh, get on the blog. Get on the email list and uh, keep yourself informed. Uh, thank you again, DJ. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, that was DJ Kuti with the Patient Advocacy Network giving us the Compassion Flower Report. Stay tuned uh, because next we have Kevin Patton. take that lead so hopefully we make a difference we are the federal building shout out everybody and uh, much respect you know Bob Marley lives Bob Marley uh, lives they don't know respect man yeah they don't know
was a writer for Cannabis Times magazine, and he uh, is a full-time occupier. He's a revolutionary. Uh, we met through Cannabis Times magazine, and we also did Occupy Los Angeles together. And I'd like to welcome to the show Kevin Patton. Hi, Kevin. Hi, Terry. How are you? <laughs> i got to correct you real fast, though. I, I am not a full-time occupier, actually. You're not? I'm, I'm a part-time occupier, full-time revolutionary. But my revolutionary tactics take different forms. They you know what? To occupy all the time. I, I totally I, I agree with that. I, I, I consider myself the same thing, uh, same way. I, I did Occupy, and uh, also uh, I feel uh, I like to call myself an, an artistic revolutionary or our, our, our t artist activist is, is the term. There you go, right on. Yeah, right on. Uh, so when we first met, we were writing with uh, Cannabis Times magazine, and you did a uh, co did you do two art articles with Jesse Ventura? Uh, article with Jesse Ventura, I did absolutely. And uh, no, so it was just the one article that you did with Jesse. No, actually, it was two uh, interviews that I had done with Jesse, and I was supposed to do a third interview with him for his newest book, at the Bimbo Cribs and Revlettykins. But actually, then he sent me the book, but then they ended up uh, they bailed out on me, and I never got a call back from him. So that sucked. Huh? So far, yes, just the two. Uh, speaking of Jesse Ventura, just recently, last night, uh, I guess he has on True TV, he has a, a show uh, there. I think it's called Conspiracy Theory or something like that. Um, he, oh, yeah. Yeah. He actually aired an episode on, we, we were discussing this, on the uh, reptilian hybrid people, uh, which I thought was interesting. Uh, to bring up reptilian hybrid again, we did a little uh, excerpt with the alien comedian uh, on the subject matter. So I thought that was kind of a... a an interesting uh, correlation there. Uh, so, when you did the interview with uh, with Jesse Ventura, what was the article or the subject matter about on the first time in Times Times Magazine? Any highlight? Uh, well, um, what was it about? Really, just whatever Ventura usually talks about. I mean, when you hear one Jesse Ventura interview, you've actually pretty much listened to them all because he just kind of repeats himself and goes on about it. But uh, it was just a normal kind of strange perspective on things. I actually huh. can't recall right now. It's been a while since I actually looked back at that interview. <laughs> now, I saw that the second article that you did, uh, he had some commentary on Proposition 19, uh, which was uh, the attempt a couple years back that California had for legalizing uh, marijuana, and, of course, we failed at the time. So, uh, now, it, I, and to my understanding, uh, Jesse Ventura is -le pro-legalization. Is that correct? That's correct, absolutely. Not just for marijuana either, but for all narcotics. I mean, you think that we should end this drug war. So do I. Yeah. So, uh, so now we're, you know, we're, let's, let's move off of the, um, the Jesse Ventura bandwagon here. Uh, so, and then we reconnected, you and I, at um, Occupy Los Angeles, uh, which, yeah. yeah. And we camped out uh, for quite a... I mean, you were there, you seemed to be there more than I was uh, in terms of, like, staying night after night. How many days would you say that you actually uh, stayed camped out in, at, at Occupy LA? Uh, yeah, me and my girlfriend uh, at the time, uh, we were going down there about, like, three or four times uh, a day, um, every week, three or four times a day, three or four days every week, and we, we just uh, switched back and go back over here at home. I don't live in Los Angeles. I live outside of Los Angeles. And so we'd stay out there for a few days, and then we'd come back and regroup and, and go back. Well, I would say I was there most of the time. Yeah, you were, you were, I mean, every time I was there, you seemed to be there. I mean, I think there's a couple times that you were there, and uh, and then I didn't, you know, I didn't, I didn't see you there. One moment that I really remember, we were getting, uh, you know, hyper criticized or they had an eye on everyone about keeping um, the property in good condition and keeping the uh, the uh, city hall area and where we were camping out really clean but there's one day that you <coughs> came up to me and you said would you give me what was it like a dollar to do a backflip or something and uh, I said yes and then and I'd never seen you do your backflip before and you did a backflip oh, yeah. off of the railing uh, that leads to the um, to the entrance of City Hall, and it actually pulled it up out of the cement. <laughs> yeah, it did. <laughs> I do remember that. So does my back. That hurt quite a bit. I jumped up on the railing, and I thought, hey, everybody check this out. And yeah. the damn thing ended up breaking out of the ground, and I went falling right on my back. That hurt a lot. 
So what, oh, Kevin? Did, did you buy five dollars? I don't know if I ever got it. Was it five dollars? You know, I know that after that I felt so bad for you that I, I first of all I said I was going to pay anyways, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then, like, when it happened, I go, shit, I better give him his money. Because, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, and you hit the, you know, you hit the pavement hard. I thought, oh, my God, he's injured. Not only oh, not only was the railing pulled out of the ground, but, uh, but. Hey, I, I jumped right back up, and I did another one. This was, like, maybe, like, three minutes afterwards. I rested for a quick second. Yeah, you. I jumped back up there and did it again. You revealed, you, you, uh, you, uh, you uh, saved yourself on that one. Mm. So, Kevin, yeah, what motivates you? What, what motivates you? What is it that you are uh, the most frustrated about uh, in terms of, let's say, things like marijuana legalization, our government? I mean, what, what motivates you to go out and become a part of uh, a huge movement or protesting against? Uh, you know, it's a, great, it's a great way for me to relieve pent-up sexual frustration. Uh -huh. so I just go out there and yell, and it's just really good therapy for me, actually. So it really all comes down to sex. Yes, absolutely. <sighs> okay. No, actually, that's not what motivates me. Um, yeah. I don't know. I, I felt very strongly about issues of freedom really my entire life, I mean, as far as back as I can remember. And uh, there are several issues I just I cannot stop thinking about. I cannot, I cannot let go. So in order to express it, the best way that I know how to express it is actually go out and, and talk to people. It's my form of activism. Protesting is good. Demonstrations are good. But that's not always how I prefer to uh, to express myself. <clears throat> but like you said, the drug war and uh, our imperialistic indentures overseas, uh, our private central bank, which controls our currency, uh, these things are very important. So that's why how that's how I deal with it. I go out there and I talk to people and try to change their minds, knowing that I probably won't be able to. Is that how you feel? I mean, you feel that even the, that that you won't be able to change their mind. I mean, do you really feel that in your core self? I do, actually, uh, especially about the Occupy. That's why I don't spend, spend a lot of time down there. It, it's because every, everybody, everybody likes to uh, have a simple answer, and the simple answer is, well, we had this big monolithic government, so if we can just take control of it and have them do everything for us, then that'll solve all the problems. And that's actually not the answer. That's, that's the problem. Uh, big government is always a problem, as far as I'm concerned. So uh, people like, like, I think they... I think people like that easy way out, when really the only way to get off the system is to become self-dependent. And the only way to do that is uh, stop funding all these damn things. Uh, gardens are great. Community gardens, private gardens are a great idea. And, and democratizing currency. But those are, those are proactive steps that people have to take, and it's, it's so much work. So it's, it's better just to go out there with a the fine and say, well, I want to free this, I want to free that. But it's not going to do anything. You're only empowering the monster. So, you know, I can go down there and I can talk on blue in the face, but a lot of times it doesn't, it doesn't do the trick. Because everybody just says, oh, it's capitalism, it's capitalism. And most people don't even know what capitalism is, so it's just, it gets a bad rap. Everybody gets tossed aside. I don't think people even understand what communism is, uh, really. I, I think that a lot of people are confused about a lot of terms that we end up, you know, saying, well, I, I don't want to have health care because I believe in capitalism. I had somebody tell me that. I don't, I don't believe in, in, in giving health care to everybody in the United States because, because I'm a Republican and I believe in capitalism. I'm, I'm like, yeah, but you're working for a $7 an hour job with no health insurance. And you're, you can sit here and tell me something like that. And you don't, I don't even know if you really grasp. Uh, or even at the time no, when this person told me what that free, meant. Okay. Nothing free, though. Know, come on. Right. I, I know everybody wants free everything. They want free health care, but nothing's free. It has to come from somewhere. That's why you know, either either we're going to pay for it now in this generation, or we're going to be paying for it in the future. And I, I think it's just incredibly immoral and unholy to place this entire national state debt on the unborn generations who have absolutely no fucking say in what they want to do, and what was happening today. So I just I can't I can't get down with it. And that goes for all these industries. That goes for every single institution that is feeding off the uh, off the state. I just don't agree with them. Kevin, I, I want to ask you, what, what is your age? I'm 27. You're 27. Okay. I'm just, you know, because a, a lot of people feel um, that the uh, Occupy movement um, is, is pretty much a youth movement. I mean, there's some older people, but uh, I just kind of want to get a demographic of the youth that um, knows and is protesting against what's happening. We're going to take a break right now, uh, and we'll be right back. Stay tuned.
I have the freedom to think however I want. This is the United States of America, and I think that I'll let Terry do the thinking for me. Terry Joyce puts the probe back in prohibition. Terry Joyce knows more about conspiracy theories than anyone in the United States of America, and that's because she makes up most of them. Terry Joyce can host a show like no one's ever seen, but that's only because no one's ever seen her host a show before. That's why I'm asking you to watch the Hollywood Hemptress Hour with Terry Joyce, and you can trust me because I'm a warlock. Which is honor. Magazine, former writer. Uh, he also has his own blog, and uh, he is a revolutionary. Participated in the Occupy movement, and um, we we're, we're here. Thank you for staying with us, Kevin. Are you there? Uh, hi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm here. Rupert Declo goes, "Is he back eating soup?" <laughs> Rupert Declo. 
Uh, Rupert Declo is, our, is the um, infamous uh, producer here at Hollywood Hempress Hour that you never really see him. You just hear his voice. Uh, so uh, another question I have now. Now, I saw one of your signs that you have, and I've posted it. It's going through the feed right now where, while the interview is going on. Uh, you hold, held up a sign that says 9-11 is an inside job. Uh, do you really feel that? Yes. In fact, I think the evidence right now is absolutely overwhelming against the Bush administration. The problem with 9-11 truth when you tackle it, though, is that everybody likes to, it, it's the same old government line with conspiracy, but let it to upset, uh, 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 let it to blur all the stories, like to really muddy the water so that there's really never an objective conversation about it. So, uh, really, I took a really simplistic view on it. I think that the, the government had lots and lots of prior knowledge, and there's plenty of indication that the uh, Bush administration won those attacks to happen, as all empires like self-inflicted wounds, because it gives them an excuse to do everything. They can go do anything they want. So that's 9-11. I don't talk about whether or not there were uh, explosives here or there, or whether or not there were uh, hologram planes or whatever. <clears throat> it's too complicated, so I don't go that route. But absolutely, I, I think the evidence is really pretty damning against the, the Bush administration. Where do you think, if, if, say for instance, like if, if, if a person was curious, and they wanted to uh, research 9-11 and get some uh, the most accurate information on it as possible. Are there any type of videos or places that you would recommend for somebody? Well, sure. But I would recommend uh, Michael Rupert's book, The Crossing the Rubicon. Um, that's a really good book. There's also The War on Freedom um, by... Actually, I forgot that guy's name. The Crossing the Rubicon by Michael Rupert will begin. There's lots uh -huh. of information out about 9-11. There's, there's, I mean, there's quite a bit. The library is pretty stacked. What about so loose you change? Up yourself. Do, you, do you feel that... Like, loose, change, loose change is okay, I guess. It's all right. But again, they, really take, they, they start looking at other different aspects of it. Mm -hmm. And it, that's fine. Yeah, it, it's, it's good information. They, I mean, with something like 9-11, you have to take all the information and just take it for what it's worth. Yeah. Well, there's also Michael Moore's uh, uh, Fahrenheit 9-11, which also points in that direction and makes some interesting... Yeah, I, I don't give much credence over to Michael Moore. I think Michael Moore's an idiot. Oh. Uh, he mentioned it inside of his book, but he never, or his movie, but he never really explored it very much. I mean, he mentioned it in passing mention, really. So what do you think about the uh, past legalization of marijuana in Colorado and uh, Washington State that just happened a couple days ago? I think it's fantastic. I, I, I smoked the blunt as, as a tribute to uh, the legalization because it's really fantastic. Yeah. I, I, it's great, really. I think it's, it's wonderful. Uh, Washington and Colorado now can, as long as they can, they can go forward with it and not give a fuck about what the federal, uh, federal government says uh -huh. and just not care, then I think it's, uh, it's good. But actually, I think they'll probably cow out of it to the government. If, if, if the feds come in and say, I want you guys to stop, they probably will stop. I mean, the Fed makes all the, uh, the decisions anyways. Well, it didn't stop medical marijuana. I mean, they, they've been raiding the dispensaries, and, and, and then, you know, nothing happens, and they reopen again, and it just seems to be this whole strange tacket. tacket. Well, the medical marijuana had a different constituency, though. The medical industry had all these patients behind it, and they, they were a uh, huge uproar when, when people started um, cracking down on dispensaries. I mean, you don't really have that with the recreational aspect. I mean, people were just dismiss it and say, oh, he's trying to get high. But you know what? the thing with cancer patients. They're, they're going to, I mean, first of all, though, though, there is something significant about people voting for a certain way of life. And to have the federal government come in is blatant against uh, what the voters want. And I think that, I, I believe, to some people, I and mean, that's the reason why I began to stand up for it was because I thought, well, you know what, I voted for this, and you know, I, I'm close to a dispensary, and yet you, I, it's being, it's being, I'm not even in the dispensary, I'm in a doctor's office, and I'm, I'm, I'm being, being held at gunpoint. And that was a, a really shocking um, realization for me. I don't even think that I would be doing the show right now if I hadn't had that particular incident and that fact was pointed out to me. So if they do come after, uh, you know, say Washington State or Colorado, uh, when you're talking about businesses, too, you're talking about people, this could possibly increase an entire different network of livelihood for, pe from pe for people, uh, from trimming marijuana to 
uh, to uh, places opening up that have smoking cafes, entertainment in the smoking cafes, huge revenue of business and a flow of income in, during a time where our, our economy is suffering. And really, for what reason? Uh, and so if the federal government does come after it, after two states have actually legalized it, I don't feel that it's going to look good and that it might be the fire that lights people to, to realize what's going on in our government. Do you agree? Yeah, po yeah, possibly, absolutely. I mean, you know, it could have a negative effect on the feds. If they did come in and start doing all these raids, as they've done in California, it could definitely have a, a, a negative backlash for them, certainly. So I have another question to I ask you. I thought it was just leave people alone instead of coming in there with the raid. Well, I would so I don't, too. I don't, we don't have to do all that, but if that's what it comes down to, that's what it comes down to. Well, I mean, if they do do it, then we realize that we're, you know, that's where our tax dollars are going to, too. So uh, it, it, just, it just goes on and on uh, about, like, the waste of money for, uh, for prohibition and the drug war that we're, that we're under. Uh, now, you had an incident with the police. Like, you went up to Occupy Wall Street recently in New York. And now, wasn't there some sort of altercation that you had while smoking marijuana out there? No, actually. I, I didn't have any confrontation with the police when I was out in New York. You didn't? But I... No, I didn't. No, I was lucky. I stayed away from the police. Uh huh. But um, yeah, a couple of my friends that I was with out there, they they got hassled. From yeah, marijuana. I saw one of my homeboys from, from Tampa. No, it wasn't from marijuana. Um, one of my homeboys from I uh, met down in Tampa. He had actually I hadn't even seen this guy. I just I went to New York after Tampa, and I I just I was with the crowd on 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 the, on the 17th, the one year anniversary. And I just see the cops just just pouring in this group, and then they start kicking and and, and punching. And all of a sudden, I see my homeboy get up. He's dragged up from the crowd. Huh? Oh, messed up. Over well, marijuana. I didn't have any personal competition myself. It's what I find no, interesting about. Um, oh, it wasn't about marijuana. He just got harassed. It was not. Okay. But he was. Uh, I think he, he pushed one of the cops back. He one of the cops tried, tried to grab him off the curb, and he shoved him off of him. Huh. What I find interesting about, like, about Occupy LA, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, it, people were getting uh, arrested for open containers of alcohol, and yet we were oh, trying yes, to that smoke was me uh, in LA. I yeah, had a uh, Reed was totally okay, container. which was which I thought was really ironic. I want to ask you one last question. We got to wrap it up in the next couple minutes. So you've done a lot of um, activism. You, you worked as a, you're a writer, you're a blogger. What do you see next for yourself, Kevin? What's the next frontier? Myself. Oh, you know what? I'm trying to go to the Mayan temples. I don't know if that's going to happen, but I'm trying to put, like, a thought process out there. I'm trying to just, to just, like, manifest it in this universe. I'm just, I'm talking a lot about it. I'm talking to people, and hopefully it happens. What was it again? I, I don't know if I, if I forecast it, but maybe, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Well, I, I missed what you said that you want to do. I, mean, I, I, I didn't hear it. What was it? Yeah, I want to go to the Mayan, I want to go to the Mayan Temple. The Mayan Temple? It's, it's the end of the world, Gary. Yeah. Well, very cool. I think I, I think that's a that's a that's a wonderful goal for for uh, for I guess like December twenty first, right? I don't believe it's the end yes. of the world. I think that I believe that that there, but there is going to be a change. It may be the end of the world as we. No, our, no, our reptilian overlords are going to come down. and We're going to do battle with them. And uh, we're going to become. We'll be victorious afterwards, <laughs> and then everything will start anew. It'll be beautiful. Right. Okay. Well, who knows? <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> hey, you heard it here first. Uh, well. Thank you, Kevin, uh, for uh, for letting us uh, for being on the show. And are, is there any uh, websites or is, what's the uh, blog that you a site that you want uh, you can we can direct our readers to our our listeners or our viewers? No, no blogs. But actually, I, I believe I'm supposed to get published in a magazine called Paranoia, a Paranoia magazine. I, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna get published in here. I wrote an article about, about the Bohemian Grove. Oh, Bohemian Grove. The Bohemian yeah. Grove. Which is uh, an area. Next time, next time I'll the Grove. Okay. Really very interesting. Yeah, it is. And and what is it? Is it just right before you go, just uh, tip it off. What is Bohemian Grove? A Bohemian Grove is a um, a forest kind of conclave that is 75 miles north of San Francisco. It's in the Redwood area. It's all it's all Redwoods up there. Uh -huh. And every year for like a hundred years or so, more than that, all the elites of the world, or mostly inside this country, mostly Republicans actually, they get together with their, their weapon manufacturers and all their banker friends, all the heads of industry, the heads of state, and they do a bunch of weird shit. It's yeah. really weird. I really couldn't go into it right now. It's pretty strange. Yeah, it's strange. It, it's kind of, they do like a whole creation of care ceremony and where there's a human sacrifice and things like that. And all the major uh, 
uh, politicians uh, have been there over the years, including certain entertainers like Merv Griffin and uh, certain people uh, have been there, and it's kind of like a secret uh, meeting that uh, nobody is allowed to film, be near, or even really know about takes place. A good film to see and get introduced about is Alex Jones has a movie called uh, Bohemian Grove, which you can actually watch on YouTube. Well, we got to get yeah, going. Alex, Alex, what? Oh, no. Okay. No, it's okay. Y yeah, you have. So you, you don't like the Alex Jones version? Jo the no, Alex you know, it's Alex Jones puts the spin on it. He's just, he, he's just, uh, he, he tackles it and he says, well, it's all like demon worshiping. That's what they're doing. It's all Luciferian. And it's actually uh -huh. not true. The cremation carries on actual human sacrifice. It's no. an old kind of ceremony that they do. And they just they get together and they sacrifice care, their collective conscience, their concern, their guilt, whatever you want to call it. But it's not like a real sacrifice. They don't worship Lucifer or anything. Well, I mean... It's a spin on it. And yeah, it makes yeah. people turn away from it. Yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, maybe not. Maybe so. But, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I, can, I can get your point, though. I'm not sure. I, I, I think anything where you're, like, assimilating somebody dying and then calling it cremation of care, symbolically it lacks a certain amount of compassion. Uh, which Certainly. is Absolutely. disturbing that that's, those are the people that are running our country and our, and our government and our businesses. And that's just the point I'm going to make up there. Um, but uh, we do have to go. I really thank you so much for calling in, and um, I'll, see you, I'll see you soon. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Terry. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. Uh, this is Bob Marley. This is like Bob Marley. What, is, what do you call it? Shroud. There's a Bob Marley shroud right here uh, where we like where we normally go to the bathroom. Uh, this is like uh, I guess like this is like part of the city hall and if you see that orange cone right there we all line up to go to the bathroom there. Right now there's nobody there which is really heaven because uh, uh, the porta potties really suck. Uh, but uh, yeah, here we are, the Shroud of Bob Marley, Buffalo Soldier. giving us a delicious recipe. Uh, how are you today, Shiloh? I'm doing very well. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Uh, awesome. So uh, it's a great day. We're, we're getting uh, towards the holidays. Do you, have a, do you have like a holiday recipe for us? Oh, my gosh. Do I have the holiday recipe for you? It is called the Jolly Green Bean Casserole, and it will knock your socks off because most of us like um, green bean casserole, mm. and if you make it gondified, it just makes it all the better. And I have that recipe for you. Wow, wow I just started easy. to scrowl. Did you did anybody hear that? <laughs> I, <swear to> God. <laughs> I, think, I think Rupert Decklo did. It was like, <laughs> give it to me. Okay. <laughs> give it to me. And it's super easy. Again, it's uh, 30 minutes from start to finish. You get uh, 32 ounces of frozen green beans. Mm. Um, four cups of water, 10 ounce can of cream of mushroom soup, or if you don't like the mushroom soup, you can get your favorite cream of whatever soup, um, 10 ounces of milk, one half cup midnight oil, one teaspoon garlic powder, one half teaspoon black pepper, and 24 ounces, a uh, 24 ounce can of onion strings that you buy in the store. So you put your water and your green beans into a saucepan and you cook them for 8 to 10 minutes until they're, you know, mostly cooked. You drain off the water, you add everything else except for the half of a can of onion strings, and you give it a good stir. 
You pour the green beans into a 9 by 13 baking pan and bake at 300 degrees for 25 minutes. Twist up a big fat green stock and see how high you can get. It's one of the steps. And then after it, it cooks into the oven for 25 minutes, remove from oven, add the other half of the onion strings and bake for another 10 minutes. Serve. It's the heavenly treat hot. But don't burn your tongue because it's a it's a long hard wait. <laughs> wow, that sounds great. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm and let me that. say that this makes a great like potluck dish. So if you're going to a holiday party and you know that your friends are cool with it, if you make this dish, I mean, really, it takes no time, that and almost no effort really, and you bring this dish as a potluck dish to all your Christmas holiday parties, you will be a hit. You will be the star. Everybody will talk about you. This is the truth. And you'll be invited to more parties, which is always good. Oh, without a doubt. Yeah. Without a doubt. In fact, everybody will ask you, where did you get that recipe, blah, blah, blah. It, it's really a party winner. Wow. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to definitely put that in my stocking stuffer and make sure that I bring that to one of my parties because uh, I'm, I'm oh, sure man. I'm going to one. Be uh, <laughs> <laughs> terrible if you're not inviting you. No, yes, you are because right. I've got a pot casserole. Um, so, well, well, you know, will knock your socks off. So now where can we, we see this recipe? This is going to be up in your blog at where? Uh, at gondelicious.com, and uh, you go to the blog page, and it will be up there and also under the recipe section. Wonderful. So gondelicious.com. Visit us. Check us out. Also remember that Gondelicious makes an amazing Christmas gift. It is the best fourteen twenty that you will spend anywhere, and your friends will always remember you and will most likely invite you over when they cook. That's right. Thank you so much, and happy holidays. Uh, thank happy you for holidays in. to you. We'll see you mm -hmm. next time. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. That was Shiloh Jinglefoot with Delicious Dishes, um, giving us a great holiday recipe to bring to your family and friends. Well, maybe not your family without warning them. <laughs> I think, my, yeah, they wouldn't be happy with me if I served that up at Thanksgiving or something like that and didn't tell them. Uh, again, we want to thank you for tuning into the show. Uh, shout out to Kevin Patton for calling in today, uh, giving us the scoop on Occupy and marijuana, uh, as well as DJ Couty. We'll see you next time.